<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. It's Wednesday, January 26. Uh, we are going to start by reviewing with uh, Ms. Holly Morehouse, who is the Executive Director of Vermont After School, some of the work that this committee was involved in last year around uh, uh, appropriating funds, working with our colleagues in um, appropriations, as well as our House colleagues on making certain that students uh, have after school uh, programs and summer programs. And so with that, uh, Ms. Morehouse, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. Uh, we'll pass uh, the baton to you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so the, for the record, I'm Holly Morehouse with Vermont After School and I'm thrilled to be here uh, to talk to all of you. And I, I'd, I'd love to start with a big thank you to this committee. I cannot um, say enough about your leadership and support, uh, both around the funding for summer 2022 and around uh, the bill that really came out of your committee to create the Universal Task Force uh, that uh, operated uh, last spring um, and developed their report under the leadership of Senator Perchlick and Representative Payela. We are in a very different spot um, here a year later because of those those two important actions um, that you all took. Um, I am excited to talk about what happened in summer 2021 and, and where those dollars went and what we saw as, as results. I'm also um, you know, excited to talk about what we need to do next and where we're looking for summer 2022. Um, starting with summer 2021, I it was a big success. I, I mean, I, I know you can't always come in and say, but this, this program worked. I mean, we over and over heard from funded programs that even in the midst of a global pandemic, they served more children and youth than they had in years past. And they had larger programs than they were able to run in years past. That was a huge win because we were all talking about, you know, this time last year, the mental health needs, the, the need for connection, caring, relationship, engagement, um, that our children and, and youth were really needing and how important summer 2021 was going to be. Um, and, and you helped us right, be able to respond to that. Um, summer 2022 is going to be just as important, <laughs> I will say, um, given where we are. Um, I, one of the successes um, also, and I have to express appreciation for the whole summer enrichment team that was run out of the governor's office, um, that cross-agency team, this initiative was about that grant competition and, you know, the $4 million, but it was also about creating a central website where we can map all the programs in the state. It was about creating mental health resources and support um, in partnership with the Department of Mental Health for families and youth that are entering back. It was about working with the Department of Labor um, on youth employment opportunities. It was about working with the Child Development Division, the Department of Health, um, uh, Department of Natural Resources, Senator Sanders' office, um, and more. And I have to say that um, all the work that we did, and especially around the summer's money grant, would not have been possible without the close partnership with the Agency of Education and their ability to, um, to help us respond um, to those needs. Um, so great appreciation there. Um, Vermont After School, uh, in partnership with the Agency of Education, we did administer and run that grant competition. Um, there was about $4 million um, in that pot of funding, if you remember, for summer 2021. I, my first handout that I did send ahead of time has uh, some of the summary data for that program. Uh, but just to hit some of the highlights, um, with the dollars, we were able to expand access in particular to underserved populations. Uh, the grant funding re really had a strong emphasis on uh, children and youth who maybe normally did not have access to programs or that were from traditionally marginalized populations. Um, we were able to reduce costs to families. We were able to cut waiting lists across the state. We were also able to create jobs for high school youth. And that whole emphasis came out of actually talking and listening to young people um, about what they wanted to see. And we heard over and over again from older youth that they wanted opportunities to have some of those first jobs that you, you might have. Um, in the course of your life. Um, and then we were also able to support social, emotional, um, and academic learning uh, for the youth. We received 188 proposals uh, with requests totaling $7.4 million. We convened a panel of 50 reviewers 
that were from 12 different states. Those reviewers and readers selected 93 projects, uh, which we funded. Um, in the end, it was about $3.5 million um, of funding that was spent over the summer. So just um, while, while, while you're on that, so the 7.4 million was appropriated or just three point something of the four was appropriated? The four, four, for this summer competition, our yep. grant from the Agency of Education was for $4 million, yep. of which about 3.5 was spent over the summer. Okay. The request that we got in the proposals, uh, Senator Campion, was for the 7.4 million. That's how big the request was. Like, that was the response from the communities. Like, okay. we're willing to do more, and this is I what see. it will cost. Oh, I'm seeing it. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, lot of requests came through, 188 proposals. I mean, um, so out of the 93 projects, when we look at reports at the end of the summer, um, there were close to 13,000 children and youth that were served directly by those grant dollars, right? That wouldn't have been served otherwise, 12,877. We estimate there was about 31 new slots created across the course of the summer, 1,545 additional days of programming that would not have existed without those dollars, um, and roughly about 238 additional weeks of camps and programs during the course of the summer, and close to 500 high school and college age youth employed um, through those, those grant funds as staff you know, in those programs. The handout also on the last couple of pages, um, we could only, I mean, I could feature all 93, but we, we, we pulled out seven um, to give you an idea of how they used the grant dollars. And you'll see um, some commonalities. Um, one amazing range of programming, amazing range of programming. Our, that panel of 50 readers and reviewers commented over and over again about the level of partnerships happening in our communities and the range and diversity of programming, arts programming, making, creating, you know, building, uh, um, outdoor learning, um, kayaking, uh, learning how to repair bikes. I mean, it was just so many amazing options. Um, you'll also see that they were using the dollars for things like mental health counselors to bring them on staff for the summer, for training for staff around resilience and youth mental health, for one-on-one -on -one supports so that they could serve children with special needs, uh, for lowering those barriers to participation, whether it was transportation or cost or increasing their hours or, or um, the days that they're able to run, adding more weeks, and then reaching youth um, that they had in past traditionally not been able uh, to reach. Um, so once again, um, biggest summer ever for many of those programs. Some of the things that um, you know we would like to improve, or um, you know that where we wish there was always more. Um, there wasn't enough funding, right, for the original seven point four million in requests. Um, timing was really tight um, because the process started later. Uh, some of the grantees were not being notified until June. Uh, that they had the funding and summer programs start in June. And it was just, we were just so tight with the way the dollars flowed and being able to get that open. We're really hoping uh, for the for summer 2022 to, to move that up significantly. Um, and then uh, and another one, uh, just with the federal dollars um, outside of all of our control, there's a lot of checking that we needed to do on every expense and um, and for some of the programs that was a, that was a high burden um, um, where we tried to turn it into let's all learn together so we all can access these dollars and be great stewards of public dollars and we hired a consulting CFO through Vermont after school who also worked with the programs to help around financial practices to make sure everything was um, strong and in place um, but it was, it was a, that was a big lift. Um, and it was a reimbursement process. All of these federal dollars, the programs need to, to spend the money first um, and then submit to us. And then we submit to AOE and then, and then we, we pay them back. There was um, an addition, I will say a hundred thousand dollars that was contributed by the Vermont Community Foundation. Um, and that was, those were wonderful funds to have because often there were things that we could not cover like a handicap access ramp 
or some other equipment costs that were gonna be difficult to cover under the federal dollars that we were able to use the private dollars from the community foundation to still make sure that those expenses were possible. So that was also a really nice uh, partnership that we saw um, over the summer. I'd like to pause and um, answer any questions about summer 2021. So if, if I may, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Lyons, please. No, go ahead, Mr. Chair. No, no please, go ahead. All right. <laughs> no, so uh, just, this is 2021, I, I guess, um, and the federal dollars were significant in keeping us going. Uh, I guess we anticipate the use of federal dollars again, but I, my question really is regarding the mental health services and the link with the DMH that you had uh, our committee is very interested in finding solutions uh, for kids with mental health problems. Uh, we've linked in with schools, we're linking in with everyone trying to determine the best coordination and leadership for kids with mental health issues um, within the education system and then outside. So your the programs or the work that you did was through individual grants for mental health support, or did was there something that you actually you put an RFP out for something that would support mental health? How how did that all happen? And then I'm ask, also going to ask the same question about kids with special needs. Um, happened in 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 two ways and. Um, Senator, one, through the individual grants, um, individual programs could apply to have that extra staffing or have that extra uh, mental health counselor or something on staff so they could build it into their program in that way. And it was the same with the one-on-ones or some of the special, special needs supports. Um, we also uh, provided training and supports at the statewide level that was accessible to all programs across the state, right? Trying to raise, raise the bar for everyone and make that, that accessible. Um, I did listen to uh, part of uh, your conversation in Senate Health and Welfare. Um, I think it was yesterday when you were, were speaking about, uh, about this. And um, I, I have to say, I, uh, I, totally, I totally agree with you. Like when we hear, <laughs> from programs and from youth, like what's happening out there and what, what families are saying, it is like front and center, are we doing enough? Are we doing the right things? And I, you know, we've been, you know, thinking and thinking about that. And, the, and there's a few pieces that come come to mind from, from working with youth is, is one is we have to be listening to them. And I, we have to be in conversation with them. And you know, you know, last summer we had um, a statewide group on health equity and how access to after school and summer intersects with mental health and, and access to health care. Um, we had focus groups on inclusion and third spaces and youth serving organizations where we went in and met with young people and said, what does it take and what's really needed here? Senator Sanders had his youth town hall. The governor had his, his, his youth summit. Every single one of those conversations, we learned something new. And and, and we need to be we need to be doing that still. Um, so one of the things that I am excited about is that we right now have a statewide advisory group um, of young people from across the state who are collaborating with the governor's task force um, on how we do universal after school. And um, Vermont After School is convening that group, and they are meeting every other Tuesday. And they are looking at um, how to integrate youth voice throughout the system. They are also getting ready to launch, and this is an ask for all of you, they're getting ready to launch a major statewide initiative to collect stories and input from youth across the state about what is it like right now in your communities? What do you want in your after school and summer programs and that's third spaces? What would really help um, your families and your communities? Um, it'd be incredible if all of you could help make sure children and youth from your communities are part of that effort. That's gonna launch in, in a few weeks. Uh, the second- Sorry, who's who's launching it? Uh, the statewide youth advisory group that is working okay. with Vermont After School, okay, in partnership with the governor's task force. So I'm sure this is already on your mind, but you know, uh, the folks from from our end, I think that you'd want to just make sure they're aware of 
Vermont Principals Association, yes. any, all those groups. Great, thank you. Yes, we absolutely will. Thank Great. you. Thank you for that point. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is the Vermont Youth Project um, that you were speaking about with the Iceland project that they're doing in Chile and, um, and where we've incorporated some strong work from Finland around Youth Voice is in its third year. There are five communities. I cannot say enough for these five communities, um, despite the pandemic. Um, you know, we were the first in North America to sign on with Iceland, and we are one of the few that have continued throughout the pandemic in North America to be able to, to do this. The survey um, will happen in early February. Uh, it will be about, um, it's nine schools, it's five communities, it's, it's all of their seventh through 12th graders. It includes really important questions about mental health and well being. It's the data that we shared last year around this time. Um, it'll be a wonderful follow up to see where our young people are. Um, we should have the results back in about eight weeks. So I would love uh, to, to bring that back to your attention at that time because I think it's a great check, right, for us to see where were they in, in 2020. 2020 and where are they now? Um, and then the other piece I wanna mention about Youth Voice is that there is a youth council bill um, that is on the house side, H293, uh, that would create a statewide youth council uh, where young people could be in conversation about the issues with all of you um, about uh, that affect them and what would help. Um, we're hoping that will move out of the house and end up in the Senate, but I just wanted to flag it for you because I think those are important. Is in that, addition- to is that uh, house ed, just to make sure, or is that in? No, it's actually in, it was in house government ops. Um, it oh. got passed out of there and it's now okay. in house of probes. Um, and we're hoping it will, will move over. Um, okay. The other, the other piece, um, Senator Lyons, about the training, I will say the trainings that we're doing at Vermont After School for the field um, that are in super high demand are uh, trauma responsive systems of care, youth mental health first aid, uh, redefining resilience and building connection, uh, transformative SEL and systemic racism, and understanding compassion fatigue. Those are the ones that we're hoping over the next few months um, we will be able to expand capacity for. Um, because we are finding it's like, our, yes, our young people are struggling and the people who are working with them are also struggling. Um, and so I think that that's the role that Vermont After School can help play in helping to serve um, those youth workers, right, that are working with the young people. Who's doing the training? I'll just ask this qu a quick question. Who's doing the training? And do you have some of the older kids involved in peer um, work? Peer support. Yes, there are some great models for peer support um, throughout the state. The particular trainings that we're doing out of Vermont after school, uh, Matt Wolf and Umesh Achara, um, our youth resilience coordinator and our youth voice coordinator are the lead trainers on those pieces. Uh, they've been working with Department of Corrections. They've been working with communities. They've been working um, with the Howard Center. Um, I will say most of the support for this type of work are coming from our partners at the Department of Health. They have been amazing with supporting youth resilience work um, and health equity work and youth voice work. Thank you. Thanks for all your good work. Senator Hooker. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Morehouse, for being here and for all that you've done. I mean, in the best of times, summer programs and after school programs are important, but they're especially important now. Yes. I'm curious to know if you have um, information on the gaps geographically. I know that when we were talking about summer programs, some areas were finding it difficult to cite them or, and just wondering uh, you know, how that looks throughout the state. Yes. Um, so we are, we have been mapping for um, six or seven years now, um, access, and we've, we've been mapping it as, as points on a map and have really learned there's so much more <laughs> behind that access than just saying a point, right? It's hours of operation costs and all those pieces. Um, right now, as part of the work with the governor's task force, on universal um, after school, um, there is a, a strategic planning uh, subcommittee out of that. And um, what we have been doing to help 
prep for those committee discussions is we have gone and we have looked at the student enrollment numbers at every single school, elementary and high school in the state. And then we have gone and looked at the after school capacity. Right now we've measured it in two ways. If there is a licensed or a regulated program, we can look at their, their license capacity so we can see how they can serve 60 kids, let's say. Um, and we've also looked at the 21C funded programs and their average daily attendance. Those are the ones funded through the Agency of Education. So we have started to create measures. Um, we have it at the school level, we have it at the town level, and we have it right now at the county level, where we can say, where are we where the capacity, right, to serve children in this space is less than 20%, let's say. You know, we just don't have enough slots. Um, we have been able to identify some counties in particular that we're concerned about um, going by these measures. Um, Grand Isle, um, Essex, uh, Orleans, Wyndham, and Bennington um, are all at the, the lower end. I'm um, going by these met metrices. Um, I'm really interested to continue to dig into those conversations about, there's things that um, in our measures, because they're not reported anywhere, we're not yet measuring. So we don't know, for instance, the attendance at all the summer camps or the capacity at all the summer camps yet. So we're going to have to, because right, that's not reported up somewhere. We know the ones that we funded, but we don't know across the entire state. So we still need to do some um, more in intensive data collection, um, you know, at the sort of community level to say, what do you really have here? So we're also trying to work on um, uh, like a community asset or a community profiling process that communities could use to say, okay, here's the baseline, here's what we think you have, what else are we missing? You know, maybe it's a teen center program or maybe it's a parks and rec program that needs to be part of this picture. And then we can, we can build out from there. Um, but we, we, are, um, we are deep in those conversations and that's data that I'm happy to share or come back and you know, bring back and, and show you where we are and what we're looking at and, and hear your ideas on, on other aspects of what we should, may, may be should be including. Ms. Morehouse, did you, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, go ahead. No, just thank you. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Morehouse, how are you reaching out uh, specifically to families that might not you know, traditionally send their kids or put their kids into these kinds of programs? I, I can think of a lot of schools in my area that um, where, where there, outreach should be happening. And I, I know Bennington is not alone. There are a lot of areas throughout the state. So are those schools identified and are you working specifically on those schools? Um, yes, yeah, so outreach, outreach, if you look at the Summer Matters initiative happened um, in, a, in a really broad-based way, right? Because it is, it's outreach, it's outreach to the schools and to the guidance counselors, um, to the Family Resource Center. So everybody knew, right, that these opportunities are out there. So, so we did do that. We held webinars. Well, I just want to pause there. Did everybody know? So I'm thinking Molly Stark School, Bennington Elementary. These are schools, and I'm sure we all have them in our communities, where it, it might take an extra step. You know, it really might mm -hmm. take an extra step of somebody going and saying, hey, this is, this is, this is safe. This is good. This is reliable. These are the kinds of things that um, your child can benefit from in, by being in this program. Is that extra step being taken? Does that make um, sense? I because think it does. I think, so my honest answer is, no. I think we took some steps. Okay. I don't think we've taken all the steps. And sure, I think what sure. you're asking for is, is, um, you know, a whole, is that next round, right? That next step of yeah. where's the checklist and who had the conversation, which, which person and which school, you know, to make sure that this information is getting out to families. We did work with um, Department of Mental Health, Department of Health around communication materials for families. Okay. Uh, you know, that these programs are safe. You know, we had a whole, you know, tagline about, you um, you know, summer is safe, summer is happening, summer is the time to, you know, be doing this. We had uh, supports for families about how you talk with your kids, if they're nervous about engaging, you know, so um, we have those, we need to revamp those once again um, and look at those. And then we also 
had some communication, especially for older youth. Um, you know, older youth, I, one of the things I love about this initiative is that it does look across the full spectrum and it doesn't say that summer programs are just for little kids, right? They're for, they're for sure. everybody, right? And, and, but part of that then is going back to our young people where we haven't provided programs before for them and saying, wait, now we are, you know, and do you know about it and what do you want? Um, so the communication has to happen at a lot of levels. Have we hit everybody? No, um, we need to do it again. You know, we need to keep doing it. Um, and I guess my point is I, I'm going to be looking at least for myself. I, I remember asking the secretary of education last year when we were looking at the community schools bills uh, bill. And I, he basically said, I can tell you the 10 schools in this state that really are going to benefit from the community schools bill. And I, I just realize if you're a single parent, you've got a couple of kids, you've got a full-time job, a couple of jobs, this isn't, I, I'm worried that that's, this isn't going to reach those families. And I really want it to reach those families. Um, there are, we all know there are families that can chip in a little bit. There are families that could pay the full boat. Uh, you know, I really want to make sure that we're, we're getting those boys and girls who otherwise there's, it's just not on their radar. It's not going to be on their parents. They can bring the flyer home, but when mom or dad gets home and they're Beat, you know, from a long day, it's, it, you know, it's just not, it's just not going to reach them. So that's, that's something I'm hoping you can really prioritize by identifying those schools, those communities in this state, where we don't want to look back and say, as we did a little bit with uh, pre-K, hey, we just did something for middle and upper middle class kids only. We want to mm. make sure that we are getting Vermont's low income uh, families to participate in this. Yes. So two points on that. The grant application was designed to reach children and youth who wouldn't normally afford it. Like they, it was set up that way. Um, and we'll do that again. Secondly, I want to point to our partners um, at the Agency of Education. I know Deputy Secretary Boucher um, has done some analysis because there is a whole, right, there's millions of dollars that are going directly to schools to do after school and summer. And she's done some analysis of what schools were doing. Um, so we have, we, there is that piece of the puzzle. I really look forward to the day when we're, we're not saying these are what schools are doing. These are what non-schools are doing. And these are what teen centers are doing. And these are what parks are right. Where we're really looking at a holistic way at the whole ecosystem in the third space, right? And, and, and we're all connected. Schools are connected to community partners. Community partners are connected to schools and, and all those pieces. And I think that that's, what the governor's task force, that's part of that vision of universal after school. How do we, how do we use all those players? Um, but in the interim, I, I, I would um, point you back to her data um, that she has when she looked at what each of those schools were doing. And I think it was 94% of the schools were doing something. Um, and that might also give us some clues of which ones are more involved and which yeah. ones may need a little more effort Great. to be moving in this direction. Senator Perslick. Well, I was waiting for my question, but you used your telepathy to know that I had a question, which yes. it's really about the ne next summer. Yep. We've been working on how to prevent discrimination and programs that get state money. So and I wondered, I couldn't remember from the work in the task force, if I know this has come up a little bit with discrimination against children with disabilities, but I didn't know in general if the grant required recipients to, you know, attest to following anti-discrimination laws or something something to that regard to, to make sure that state dollars weren't going to a private program that might have, you know, discrimination. Yes, that's a really important question. So, and the answer is yes. So the, the assurance is um, in order to get the funding, um, they do have to assure that they're able, you know, that they're not discriminating um, and that they're able to, to serve, um, you know, all children and youth in their, in, um, in their ADA compliant and that, you know, that their, their staff um, have been fingerprinted and, and there's, there's a whole list of assurances in there before they receive any funding from us. And I'm happy to share those um, with you as well. Uh, the other piece, um, that we are adding this year in the review process um, with that 
as I said, we had a panel of 50 reviewers last time around. It was a very diverse group, 12 different states. We got experts on inclusion and, and um, anti-racism and, and all, you know, and youth of all ages and all kinds of things. Um, but we want to go another step this year. So we have contracted with a national trainer um, that, that does a training specifically for readers and reviewers of grants and materials. It's an anti-bias training. And so we will be offering that for all of the, the readers and reviewers who are involved in this grant process as they're going through the materials so that we can try to make the process even more equitable for, for those organizations that are applying as well. Um, so we, we are adding that layer in. And that's for summer 2022, um, which um, I, I wanna talk about, um, I just wanna uh, say um, how excited we are about the governor's budget um, and the way that after school and summer is supported in those budget proposals. Um, not only that the money's there, but that you, you start to see um, us as a state looking at the different ways we can do this. So there is the, the 7 million on the child care financial assistance side that will help get more programs into uh, that program. So families can access the subsidy program on that side. Um, you also see there is some additional funding for school-based summer programs and after school programs. And then there is um, an additional four and a half or so million um, that will be coming um, through Vermont After School, again, in partnership with the Agency of Education uh, to run a grant competition for summer. Uh, now, this one's larger. It's summer 2022, next year school year, and then summer 2023. So it's um, a, little, a little bit more money, but for several more time periods. It's going to be stretched thin across time periods. Um, but it is... Uh, this effort to continue to increase access um, in these time in you know in summer and in after school in this next round, and uh, grantees will be able to look at whether they're doing only summer or school year and all those different pieces. Chusen, I mean, is this something that you think uh, our committee should weigh in with our appropriations committee in terms of that dollar amount? In other words. Uh, Say a little bit more about that. Um, it, it's a little more money, but it's a little bit more time. You said dollars are gonna, it, things are. Yeah, and, yeah and, and I don't think that's anything that the, the governor's team isn't aware. We've talked about that. Last time we okay. had about 4 million just for summer and now yeah. we're gonna have you know four and a half um, or five and we're trying to do two summers and a school year. Um, so, it's gonna, it's, it's different, right? It's gonna look different. So that, that might be a question of what, what can we achieve um, and what, you know, and what other funding is there. I will say we are doing everything in this grant application to align it with all of the ESSER standards. Um, the, these funds are ESSER two. We have aligned it with ESSER three as well, um, as far as evidence-based programming and, um, and, and those requirements. Um, so we have gone that extra step to try to make it, um, you know, fit in um, with where those dollars are headed and what the requirements are there as well. Um, Senator Bursley. And uh, Holly, can you remind me, us, on the connection between after school and the cannabis taxation that will start to happen in the next fiscal year? Yes, yes. So another important piece of the puzzle, right, as we start to, to pull these funding streams together. So the 6% sales tax um, in the cannabis bill is set aside for increasing access to after school and summer. So that, that's in there. That was just reaffirmed by the Cannabis Control Board um, in their report. Um, there are estimates um, of what that revenue might look like. It, you know, starts kind of small and then it builds and then it kind of comes down a little bit, you know, when other states, you know, start to, um, to come into play. Uh, but that will be a, a really important um, source to have in here as well. And I, and I, and it, 
Right. So after school and summer, children in general, youth, right, they're not a single agency issue, right? And so it doesn't take a single agency approach. It takes this multi-agency approach. So um, that's why I appreciate looking at the funding in childcare, looking at the cannabis funding, which falls under prevention and health, looking at the education funding and, and how can we, we braid and pull these pieces together. And, and that's why I also appreciate the interagency task force um, that has those multiple agencies looking together, which you know, came out in part because of the recommendations of, of the task force um, that you chaired, uh, Senator Perchlick. And just to, to confirm on the, the sales tax of the cannabis, is that, was that, a part of the governor's budget at all? Was that any of that, that 6% part of the money that was for after school or that would be, does that need legislative action? I know it was in the original legislation. And like you said, the, the cannabis control board put it in the report, but I wasn't clear if it's, if it's a done deal or if there's still legislative action or budget action for that. And if the governor had actually budgeted some of that money? Um, I don't see it in the white paper from the governor's office. Um, I can double check on that. Um, I do not, as far as I know, that it is set aside for after school, but I have not yet seen a plan of how those dollars would then get out to programs. Um, so I haven't seen that other, other piece of it yet. Um, but let me let me follow up um, on that and get back to you if that's all right. Yeah, that, that would be great because I think we got to keep our eye on the ball, so to speak, on that or it could uh, end up getting swept into some other pot. OK, thank you for that question. So do you want to just say a couple words about the Universal Task Force uh, work right now that work for you, Ms. Morehouse? Sure. Okay. And um, and I encourage you to have um, Kendall Smith out of the governor's yeah. office is, is chairing that. Um, and it's been very exciting to to work on that group. I think it's the first time ever in the however many years I've been doing this where we really have that cross table conversation. Uh, the group started meeting in November, I think, or December. So it, it's it's um, and we meet at least once a month. Uh, there are five subcommittees um, that are all working. There's a, a youth employment subcommittee. There is a, um, a best practices uh, subcommittee. There is a funding subcommittee. There is a strategic planning subcommittee. And then there is an engagement subcommittee. Um, I'm chairing the engagement subcommittee, which has two components. It has that youth engagement piece that we talked about with the statewide advisory group. And then it also has a listening to our component and public engagement piece about how do we get more voices involved in the conversations about how we shape these systems for universal um, after school and summer. Um, so I'm very excited about um, all of that. And I'm also very excited about the youth um, employment piece uh, and the partnerships that, that are building um, in those areas. Um, so I think, um, you know, Kendall would be able to share a lot more on her on what she's thinking and her plans moving forward. Um, and but that is also the the group that's looking at sort of setting benchmarks uh, each year and going back to Senator um, Hooker's question about where the gaps are and really trying to figure out where the gaps are. And for each year over the next five years, what are our benchmarks for for the system and how many more children and youth we need to create capacity for. Um, and I would add to that, how do we also, you know, set the systems around these programs? So we're not just creating programs, but we're supporting them with quality supports and training and so forth. Um, so um, it's, it's very exciting. And, and, um, and it's um, exciting to the, the connections that came out of your conversations in this committee and others, and then the legislative task force last spring and now having the governor's task force. Person. And Holly, did I remember at the beginning of the session, there was some legislation introduced, maybe in the House, maybe Representative Pajala had put something in. Is there, need, is there a need for legislation this year or would the governor support in the budget? It's really just a, an appropriations question. There's no programming uh, legislation needed. 
Um, I do not know at this time. Nothing comes um, top of mind at this time um, around legislation. Um, I do think appropriations and funding, you know, for this initiative to keep moving things forward is really important. Um, and then once again, I would love to see the Youth Council bill. Um, I would love to see our state move forward on that. It was a really strong statement about not only caring about our youth, but wanting to hear from our youth and seeing them as, as, as part of the part of the problem solvers. Well, maybe maybe it was that though, because but the youth council is doing a lot more than than aftercare or would right? They're not that in that bill, they are. They they have they have suggest there is a suggestion of a number of standing committees. It's a cross issue piece. Um, the piece that we're holding on um, our advisory group, the statewide advisory group, is just the universal after school piece right now. Yes. Great. Sarah Lyons. Uh, no, so does the universal task force have a, a link with the uh, prevention council in the Department of Health? That is a, a very broad cross-cutting group across all, all segments of government. And uh, just wondering if there's any linkage with that prevention group and or with um, the chief Pre prevention council, Monica Hutt in the governor's office. Yes, so Monica Hutt um, is on the task force. She co-chairs it with Kendall Smith and, and Heather Boucher. Um, and she is chairing the quality or the best practices subcommittee. Uh, the Department of Health um, also has representation with Elisa Stolberg from uh, uh, the Division of Maternal and Child Health. Um, so that connection is there. And I, um, I appreciate, um, Senator, what you're, where you're moving towards, right? It, it really is that Vermont Youth Project, right? That it is, about, it, it is about programming, but it is like what it is like to be a young person in these communities, Right. And, and how does that connect to prevention and wellness and, and your experience, you know, growing up in those communities? And um, and that's where I think we can take this focus on third space and what's happening and actually, you know, build out that Vermont Youth Project all across the state, which is strong on youth voice, strong on uh, community supports and the built environment uh, and a real focus on prevention and wellness and, and mental health. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Morehouse, thanks for joining us. Uh, Absolutely. Any final comments from you? No, just thank you once again. Um, I really do see um, the legacy of this work and, and the strong leadership role of this committee, um, as well as the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. So, so thank you um, for that support. If you had to choose between our committee and Senate Health and Welfare, in terms of, I mean, uh, I mean, listen, so we could go offline for a minute. I know, Seriously, but you know, don't love, you know we, me well enough we, that I'm just going to say. love partnering <laughs> with Senator Lyons. We were, I've, said, I've said it once, we'll read it in my resolution. I love mm -hmm. having the majority of, of uh, health and welfare on this committee, particularly the chair. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's great. And there, as, as things come our way, I think one of the things we're sort of figuring out, which is great, is there'll be some stuff that will go towards Senator Lyons' committee because they really do have a lot of, you know, tremendous amount of expertise in the social emotional piece, so. Yeah, and I, right. and you know, Vermont's children and youth, they need all of you yeah. <laughs> in every one of those places. So um, well, I love that we're working together. Great answer, great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you for Thanks. your time. Bye-bye. Mm,